everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our live stream. We'll be introducing the Thing from the Future activity that we have designed as part of the Wicked Problems Wolfpack Solutions course. But first, I want to introduce you to everyone on the stream today. My name is Adam Rogers. I'm a librarian at NC State, and I'll be your host today. Next up, we have Tori. And my name is Tori. I am a libraries fellow at NC State, which means I get to work on lots of cool and interesting emerging projects just like this one. And Rob? I'm Rob Dunn. I'm a professor of applied ecology uh, at, at, at NC State. I've been here 14 years now, and I get to study the biology of daily life. Thanks, Rob. And Jordy? I am Jordi Marie. I'm a professor in the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, and I'm a specialist in uh, what I called socio-cultural environmental studies and film studies. Thanks, Jordi. And Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Ramirez. My pronouns are she, her. I am a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, and I work primarily in the microbiology undergraduate program where I am an educator and a microbiologist. Thanks a lot, Melissa. So we're here today to play a fun game about the future, which if you're in the Wicked Problems course, you'll be also doing yourself. The game is pretty simple, really. It's a card game and you're dealt three cards that form a prompt. Tori, do you want to show us how it works? Tori, I think you're muted. Apologies, all my buttons disappeared. Okay. So as you can see, this is the game and you're working with this prompt here in the year 2021, in a future you would like to live in, there is a thing related to something else. And so to fill in your prompt, you just click the button here. So there are overalls related to agriculture. There's a tool related to water. Um, and then what you are doing is filling in a world related to that prompt. Um, and the way that we are having students engage with this is by using this template. When you click on the link on the website, it will prompt you to create a copy of the document to work in yourself. And what it looks like is this. So you fill in the cards that you get over here on the left, and then you have all of this space right here to uh, work with the prompt and respond to it as you would like. Adam, I believe you are muted. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. So let's get started. And our faculty here will be kind of our contestants on the game show. Um, so our first contestant, we have Rob. So first, Rob, can you tell us a little more about yourself, what you do at NC State, and your part in the Wicked Problems course? Sure. So uh, I'm a professor of applied ecology, and I think a lot about the sort of general rules of ecology. And so a lot of what I've been thinking about lately is how do we use our understanding of the general rules of the living world to predict what the future might be like? What do we already know about the future and what are its constraints? And so I'm super interested in this uh, endeavor because I think it's often very difficult to think about the human part of the story of the future. We know the general rules of life, but what do humans do? What behaviors uh, do we have in the future? What decisions do we make? And so I'm really excited about this project. And in the context of the course, I think my chief role is that I'm, I'm one of the, the speakers and, and I tell uh, one of the stories that the students will hear early in the course. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm very excited to do, do this today. Adam, thanks for having me along. Great. Thanks, Rob. So are you, feel like you're ready to play? Uh, yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, Tori's going to bring up the game again. And um, I guess uh, on your cue, Rob, we'll, we'll push the deal cards button. Uh, let, let's do it. Let's see what we get. What and just to if I don't like the cards, we can deal again, right? Right. Yeah, you can decide to keep one of the cards if you want. Um, you'll just have to remember it, um, or you can throw out both cards and get another two cards. Your your green card is going to stay stay the same. All right. Let's let's see what we have to start with. In the year 20, 20, 2121, in a future you would like to live in, there is a headline related to the zoo. Ooh, that's pretty good, but let's, uh, 
I think maybe I, there's a, a better one lurking. So let's 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 go ahead and deal the cards yes. again. <laughs> All right, this is ridiculous. Um, yeah. In the year 2121, in a future you would like to live in, there is uh, an overalls, and we'll ignore the agreement problem there, related to insects. Sounds pertinent to a field ecologist. Yeah, I think a lot about insects. So let, let's go ahead with this one. So let's imagine that as we think about the future, one of our big constraints is how do we imagine sustainably making our clothing? How, how do we imagine what our clothing is made of? And so as I just sort of spitball this and think about it on the fly, I could imagine maybe one scenario is what if all of our clothing is made of insects, of Ooh. the parts of insects? And so like that's that's one. Um, but maybe another is there's a huge problem we actually talk about in the course with regard to clothing waste. And so what if waste clothing is all recycled by insects that we then eat? Um, or you know, maybe, in, and uh, you could also go in the direction of what, what if our clothing uh, is designed in the light of things we learn from insects. And so insect exoskeletons, they favor some good microbes and disfavor bad microbes. And so what if there was clothing that could favor good microbes that we need while at the same time helping us to stay uh, free of, you know, say viruses like COVID or deadly pathogens. And so wow. those are the kinds of things that this makes me think about. Um, but but uh, but but I'll I'll pause here and I'll I'll keep thinking about this because maybe my first reactions aren't the best ones. Yeah, and this is a great example of um, you know you got a prompt about something you think a lot about, and so I think you know it would be great for students to to seek out a prompt that maybe has something related to one of their passions or their their interests in research or, or study. Are you um, saying I cheated? <laughs> you got the luck of the draw here. All right, all right. Um, and, and I like how you went in these different directions too, you know, insects forming these different roles related to overall. So I think that creative process is one um, to follow too. I think there might be a, a an easy first answer for this one. I don't think there really was, but there's these different paths you can go down. And that's the, that's the creativity of it is deciding which one you want to explore further. I, and I guess too, I made the decision that instead of focusing on overalls per se, I would just think about overalls as a as a kind of clothing, and then think about clothing. And right. so, and I think that, things, that that that's a possibility too. Great can, interpretation too. Yeah, okay. it could be a whole fashion line for you, Rob. Yeah, I think I outgrew overalls, but maybe 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 that's uh, maybe that's wrong. I'll so one one question I have is, you know, that first card says in the year twenty one twenty one. How how do you go about thinking about that amount of change and that time of change? Well, I mean, for, for me, um, you know, relative to our daily decision making, 2121 seems a, a long way away. But as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, it's actually very soon. And, and so, um, you know, part of me recognizes that some of the human decisions that we're going to make for 2121 are hard to imagine. You know, think back to the world 100 years ago. And a hundred years ago, the world we now live in would be pretty hard to fully anticipate. And and yet at the same time, uh, 2121 is soon enough that features of the world in 2121 are probably nonetheless going to be quite similar. Like we're probably still going to wear clothing, uh, even if we don't, you know, who's to say what the fate of overalls is. But and so <laughs> I was trying to think about, well, what are the things that are that feel a little bit radical to me and maybe more radical than I'm totally comfortable with, but are also at the same time bounded by the realities of the biophysical world. Um, yeah, so that's how, that's how I thought about it. And, and I guess the other thing too is that even though 2121 seems a, a long way away, we make decisions every day that relate to 2121. You know, the roads we're building today are roads that will influence how people move and where they live in 2121. And, and so in that way, it's also not so remote. So th those are all the kinds of things I was thinking about. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Jordy, Melissa, any um, any thoughts for Rob and in, in going about this prompt? Anything to add here? I think he made excellent points and he, he thought in, in uh, different directions. 
and he very quickly uh, came up with very exciting and, and intriguing and potentially very, very productive ideas. So I'm impressed. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, Rob, you feel like you're you're ready to, to be on your way and we'll move on to the next contestant. All right. Yeah, this was super fun. Thank you, Adam. And of course, stay on and um and and you can give your insights to the, the other prompts as well. All right. So next up, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and um, bring Jordy on to uh, to play the game. So um, on your cue here, Jordy, we'll we'll deal the cards again. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Made like a drum roll. Oh, you still got insects. You got postcard related to insects. Okay, there's a postcard related to insects. Let's do a different one just so we do so, something different <laughs> on insects. Yes. <laughs> Although they're going to inherit the world. So it's <laughs> most kind of relevant. But anyway, let's try a different one. There is a monument related to pets. Hmm. Let's speak to you. Well, um, Okay, they say the third one is the charm, so let's go for a third one and I'll take it, yeah. whatever it is. So, yeah, um, there's a passport related to power. Wow, okay. Uh, okay, um, what, what does this uh, tell me? Um, well, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that um, okay, passport is of course uh, something that has a lot of connotations, political, social, economic, uh, in terms of identity. Um, uh, Absolutely. In a, in a future, if I'm if I'm and of course it's it's a, it's a, an expression of power. So the two are directly connected. Um, now, since the green card says in a future you would like to live in, and we discussed this last week, so we're not talking about the future that necessarily I think we will be living in, but a future that I would like to live in. I, of course, would love to um, live in a world in which there would be no need for pass passports. There would be no frontiers. Certainly, there will be no walls between countries. Um, so um, maybe um, the passport as we know it today um, might be a museum piece, something like one of the old postcards that we will see later, maybe uh, from the past that would tell us uh, about a different way of looking at the world, a world with lines and frontiers and, and borders and, and walls. So it might be something we might find in a museum. That's one thing that comes to mind. The yeah. other idea that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, that, um, that also brings to mind um, one of the previous cards was Monument. And I think that's an interesting one for, for folks playing the game to consider is like what in the future will be telling the story of the past. And, and I think you're kind of moving that direction too with your thinking about passport. Is, is the passport actually an artifact and not something that's actively used in, in this future you're imagining? Right. So um, so that's one one thing. And then the other thing that comes to mind is the idea that uh, maybe, um, but again, my mind goes towards dystopian futures, uh, futures yeah. that I don't want. So I'm, I'm not going to comment on, on those, but maybe in a different direction, a passport for um, not just for humans to go from country to country, but maybe a different type of pass passport. Um, um, I'm trying to think how this would be relevant to other species, for instance, yeah. or rather than going from one country to another, maybe uh, something that you would need to go into certain places. Um, but I'm not sure I would want that. Um, but well, there's yeah, other part of the passport that's like kind of collecting your your travel log, um, which is like the the lighter version. I don't know how that's related to power. Um, well, yeah, everything's related to power. Everything's yeah. related to power. So that that is it's almost redundant. Well, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, but but yeah, yeah, I like that idea. Something like a journal, like a travel log. 
uh, like a diary <coughs> of your travels, of, of your journeys. Um, I, I like that idea too. Jordy, you brought up an interesting yeah. point, which is, um, you know, the game doesn't ask us to predict the future. Um, and also that, you know, a lot of where our minds often go is, is to a dystopian future. And so the green card is really nudging you away from that, which can be challenging because a lot of our kind of cultural um, presence of the future and, and also, um, you know, realistic news uh, about the future is is pretty dark and bleak. So um, is it an interesting opportunity for, for us and for the students to think about the futures that they would want to live in? Yeah. Yes, exactly. In fact, um, just to, to finish my, my intervention here, uh, the passport as such is a pretty recent uh, invention. I mean, <laughs> we only have to go a few decades back or just a couple of centuries back, and there was no such thing as passport as passports. So the 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 development of the passport as, as such is uh, parallel to the development of, of nations and, and nation states and, and uh, frontiers. So in, in that sense, it's a product of modernity with all the very dark sides that modernity has, has brought to us and also the ability to travel and to travel further distances, which makes passports relevant because uh, in the past, you just could not imagine traveling to certain places. So the very yeah. idea of the passport was unnecessary to begin with. Hmm. Well, Jordy, do you feel like you have enough to go on here? Would you like to, to stick it with passport and see if you can get another terrain card that's a, that's less abstract or? Oh, could I still change? Okay, yeah, oh. let's change. <laughs> <laughs> let's do another one. Let's hold passport. We can't do that on the screen, but we'll just remember that your blue card is passport. Passport related to oceans. Oh, okay, yeah. I, no, jacket related to oceans. Yes, I, I, yeah. Oh, okay, you're going to go clothing too. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that one. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for the, the, all the great conversation because I know students will be faced with these more abstract ones, which I think will are a lot of interesting territory for speculation, but also might be harder to realize into a, a, a physical, you know, into a, a thing as the, the game asks you to. All right, Jordy, we'll, we'll we'll leave you there if that if you're good with that. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll do I'll do something with that. I don't uh, know. Well, I guess first, uh, Rob, Melissa, any any thoughts um, on Jordy's cards here on jacket related to oceans or? I had some thoughts on um, a passport related to power. So when I was thinking of power, I tried to think of it in different ways from the way we might typically think of structures of power and kind of thought about energy. And I, I kind of like the idea, hopefully, of being able to maybe combine that memory piece of a passport, kind of capturing your memories with maybe capturing all the different types of power that I hope we are able to uh, create in the coming hundred years. Maybe maybe we can look back now and and see some evolution in, in the ways that we generate power. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, like your passport is a record of you saw the one last remaining coal power plant or something like that. <laughs> I, I, I really like both Melissa and, and Jordy's takes on the passport and the power. And, and what really strikes me about them is that neither of them are the things that I would have thought about. And I, I think for me, that's one of the really exciting things about this project for, for the students is that whatever your answer, whatever your uh, consideration of these cards, it's likely to be different from what other students do and what we would do. And there are no right answers. And, and, and to have all these together and to begin to be able to see all of these different futures that we might not have thought about on our own I think is really powerful and exciting. And so I, I very much enjoyed Jordi and Melissa's comments, but I look forward to this broader set of imagined futures. Absolutely, me too. You um, know what, I go back to, I, I'll keep the passport and power thing. I think I can do more with that, yes. This is great modeling for, for all of our students. <laughs> you don't have to just push the button once and deal, get, Go with the cards you got. You can go back and forth and yeah. you know, creatively think about how you might approach 
the cards and if you feel like you want to move on to another another thought exercise um, by all means do. All right, thanks a lot, Jordy. We'll, we'll um, move on to Melissa now. So Melissa, you're up. Um, whenever you're ready, you can press the deal cards button. <laughs> All right, Tori, let's go. There is a device related to journalism. Hmm, I, the device is pretty broad, so that's good, but I think I wanna switch my terrain up. So let's go again. Oh, a video related to Charlanta. Okay. Hmm. And, and maybe could we explain what Charlanta is? to the viewers? From my understanding, the idea is that um, the area between Charlotte, North Carolina and Atlanta is becoming um, increasingly urban. Is that correct? And that um, this could create a huge swath of the, the Southeast that um, is uh, really different from, from how it's uh, typically been. Is that correct, Rob? Yeah, that's that's correct. And this is something featured in Adam Toronto's talk, this idea of a of a this giant southeastern megacity, um, which which isn't faded. It's it's one future. Mm -hmm. Um, I like this set of cards a lot, but let me let me see what the third the third uh one has for me, but I might go back to this one. A device related to fashion. Oh my gosh, this is good too. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm definitely going to go with this one here, a device related to fashion. So this is super exciting. Um, and I think that uh, Rob's um, overalls made of bugs kind of <laughs> got me thinking about um, the materials that we use in fashion and how that might change over the next hundred years out of necessity, but also out of, you know, innovation. And um, so I, I'm thinking about um, how much our fashion would change based on textiles, but also how much the textiles will change based on the technologies that we have to make the textiles. And so I know that this is a huge area of research here at NC State. We have a whole um, college devoted to studying uh, textiles. Um, and one thing that I like to do also in my job at NC State is I like playing with 3D printers, <laughs> which Adam knows about. And I've been super interested to see the way that um, fashion designers um, here at NC State and also more broadly have um, started to use 3D printers in fashion. And so as um, that technology changes, I'm starting to think about all of the different um, materials we can use. What can we um, infuse our materials with to, to make them um, work for us a little bit better? Um, so this is a great set of cards for me. I feel pretty, awesome. pretty excited about this one. Great to hear. I, I was just reading about uh, the development of the Apollo spacesuits last night in a book with my son and, and just like the the level of engineering and design and technology and testing and testing and testing that went into those, um, you know, the original future fashion. <laughs> um, Absolutely, and I, I kind of was thinking about it more from the perspective of like, things that we would wear every day, but you're absolutely right, as we have the opportunities to explore more and more extreme environments, what will that necessitate in terms of uh, things like spacesuits or um, exploring the deep sea? Yeah. And I'm curious how your your own research maybe comes into play there because you know a, a garment is really about connecting with your biology in, in ways and you know is there is there something there to, to explore as well? Yeah, I really um, so I think that one of the, my hopes for the future is to really see some very cool microbial biotechnology. And I think that, of course, microbes have roles in, um, you know, keeping us healthy and those things. But I also wonder about what sort of really fun things can, can people do with microbes. Microbes can do great things like make fantastic pigments and scents. And um, how might we incorporate that more into, into 
maybe our fashion one day. Right. Super interesting. Rob, Jordy, any uh, any comments on the prompt that Melissa's ended up with? Um, I mean, I uh, I really like about this prompt and about Melissa's thinking about it, the, the ways in which it reminds us that all of these elements of our daily lives um, are embedded in broader decisions about who we want to be, about sustainability, about how we rely on other organisms. And so that a device related, it's, it's, I mean, all of the examples we've had today, they have an obscure element, but, you know, Melissa and Jordy have both taken that obscure thing and made it general, made it relevant to lots of features of our lives. And, and so I think that's a, a really nice um, aspect of Melissa and Jordy's thinking, but also of the game. How do you take something ordinary and use it as a way to think about our, the broader future? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think also we've seen how there's there's a great way that you can be fun with the prompt too and, and explore the areas of thinking that you're interested to pursue. All right, well, um, it sounds like you've, you've all got your prompts and you're ready to go. We're gonna give you about 10 minutes to work on your own. Um, on these, so we'll have you turn your cameras off and, and do that in the uh, the play sheet that Tori showed us. Um, and we're gonna have um, some segments where we'll share some more information about the game, about the libraries, uh, and then we'll bring you all back in a little bit and see see what you come up with. So um, first, we wanted to share with our audience here a little more about our work in the libraries. So Tori and I work with a new space in Hill Library that's called the Innovation Studio. And we actually have a video to show you what it looks like. All right, so that is what the space looks like. But another thing that we do with the Innovation Studio is we teach workshops on innovation and futures thinking. And that's how we first came to use the thing from the future. We'd love to invite you to some of these workshops. We typically have a few each month and you'll see them listed on our website, which we'll share in the chat. Um, and so we hope to see you at those uh, this fall. Uh, and now Tori's going to share some background on the Think in the Future. Yeah, so I'm going to start screen sharing again because I've got a couple of things to show you. Um, but one caveat we wanted to offer is that we did not create this game that we're showing you today, the Think from the Future. Um, it was actually created by the Situation Lab, which is made up of a couple of futurists working in design and academia. Um, so they have used this game in classrooms, design groups, international meetings, and many other places. We like this game because it's a fun, open-ended way to think creatively about the future, as you've seen, um, and critically about many possible futures. 
And we personally have used it in lots of different contexts as well, including um, internal meetings at the libraries as a brainstorming exercise, but also in several of those workshops that Adam mentioned that we do regularly um, with courses and campus groups. And um, typically this game is played as a physical card game. They even also have a, a print and play version um, that we'll throw the link to in the, the chat on Twitch, but you can print out this game and play it. You can order a really nice set of these cards. Um, but our challenge for this course was that we needed to find a way to play it really uh, at scale with all of the students in the Wicked Problems course. So we created it as this web app that is really easy to use. And so what we're hoping here is that now that you have this as a web app that you can pull up on your laptop, on your phone, um, you can play it yourself, of course, but then you can also introduce it to lots of others as well. So we encourage you to uh, play with friends, family, coworkers, um, and others as a fun icebreaker or in your own campus groups once you arrive on campus. Okay, thanks, Tori. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do while we're waiting for our contestants to, to finish working on their things from the future is to show you some future visions from the 20th century from about 100 years ago. Um, so I know Jordy will have some things to say about these videos, but I think we'll give him a little more time to work and we'll just show some of these and then see if he wants to share. So, um, you know, I think let's show the uh, Metropolis video first. All right, so that was a clip from Metropolis. Uh, next up, we're gonna show a short clip uh, from Jules Verne. And um, after we do that, Jordy's gonna share a little context for us about where these clips are coming from, but really interesting visions of the future from the past. All right, and then for our last clip, um, we're gonna show you um, a short bit from Forbidden Planet. He's a charming character in The Robot, able to produce on order 10 tons of lead or a slinky evening gown, always at your service. You must be the loveliest, softest thing you've ever made for me, and fit in all the right places, with lots and lots of star sapphires. Star sapphires take a week to crystallize properly. Would diamonds or emeralds do? 
you explore all the wonders of a vanished civilization. You travel deep down into the heart of the forbidden planet to discover the incredible marvels of this lost genius race. These magnificent scenes in striking Eastman color stagger the imagination. 20 miles. Look down, gentlemen, are you afraid? 7,800 levels. Yet the wonders of the planet Altair IV conceal a strange and evil force, unknown, irresistible. All right, um, so we just saw three really interesting film clips and we're gonna bring Jordy back on um, to share a little bit about what you saw. So first you saw a clip from Metropolis, afterwards um, a clip from, I believe, a Jules Verne film, and then the last was Forbidden Planets. Jordy, you wanna give us a little context on those? Uh, yeah, these are just uh, some examples of uh, uh, literary and, and film works that uh, help us see how artists and, and, and peoples in different periods about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, imagined the future, uh, what today is our present or, or our past in some cases. And the case of Jules Verne, of course, uh, everybody knows uh, he was a visionary. He wrote these novels about space travels and travels under the sea. And of course, many of the things that he imagined, of course, submarines already existed when he, when he wrote, but nothing like the type of uh, objects and, and capabilities that, that he imagined. But now we have those uh, same thing as, as, as space travel and so on. Um, of course, we still haven't been able and I'm not sure we want to travel to the center of the earth because it's probably not a nice place to be. But <laughs> anyway, uh, Metropolis is a 1927 uh, film, one of the most important and influential films of, of all times. And it's one of the films that I that I mentioned in, in the video that I did for, for the Wicked Problems uh, class um, in that it presents... Uh, an apparently utopian vision of the future, but then we, we find out that that utopia, that perfect world, marvelous world, is in fact being um, um, sustained and procured by the, the labor and, 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 and the work and the oppression of, of, of other people underneath for, for which that world was not utopian, but very much dystopian. So. Uh, in that sense, it's a uh, cautionary tale and, and also a very educational, I think, film, plus incredibly well done, especially when we think that it was done in 1927, almost 100 years ago. Absolutely. So, yeah, and the other one, oh, Forbidden Planet is a uh, 1956 science fiction. It's one of the early and also most influential science fiction movies. Of course, we'll watch it today and we may laugh at the crudeness of, of, of the effects and so on, but it's also a, a, an utopian slash dystopian film, more utopian in this case, a little naive, but an interesting film nonetheless. And of course the protagonist in that film was the robot more than any of the humans. So it's it's also an interesting, um, an interesting figure, a robot that's in a certain way more intelligent than humans. And of course, there's a whole tradition of uh, films about artificial intelligence and about robots. And uh, um, so that film is one of the early ones, first one maybe in, in that category. So, yeah. Great, thanks for, thanks for sharing all that and bringing those clips into the conversation with our, our thinking about Adam, the Adam, can I, can I chime in there too? Yeah, um, absolutely. And we're, we're gonna start showing the, uh, the, the slideshow next as well, Rob. So I, I, I think, oh yeah, I was just going to quickly, one of the exciting things I think there too is to see like, where do we go right? Where do we go wrong in terms of 
imagining the future 100 years ago. And I think the journey to the center of the earth is really interesting because in, the, in one sense, we weren't wrong with regard to how technologically able we would be. You know, we were less able than we imagined we might be. Um, on the other hand, uh, we weren't sufficiently creative in imagining how able life in general would be. And so what we now know is that the very deepest holes that humans have dug into the earth, at the bottom of those holes, there's always life. And so, so we haven't gotten as far down as we thought we might, but life is much farther than we imagined it might be. And so there's this interesting tension between what we imagine of our own abilities and what we imagine for the rest of life, which I think it re recurs. It's interesting. I imagined if, if we could get to the center of the world, we would find plastics, probably. That's what we would find. <laughs> we find them in the bottom of the, in the deepest bottoms of the, of the sea right now. But yeah. So next we wanted to take a quick look at um, a slideshow of images um, from envisioning the future from about a hundred years ago. So Tori's going to share those, but also just, um, it will just check in. How are y'all doing with your, your prompts? Have you got something to share in just a few minutes here? Um, and we'll be sharing the, that slideshow of um, the play sheets. Great. Melissa says yes. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just uh, read a bit of this quickly. So in the year 1900, a uh, chocolate company produced a series of postcards imagining the wonders of life in the year 2000. Um, so we'll just show you what they look like. They're really interesting and, and fun and kind of funny. And I know Rob is particularly drawn to some of these. So you got people uh, with their their personal flying machines. I mean, it goes back to the clothing again, because, you know, here, here they are, these amazing inventions. I mean, the, what's the one that's like a hypodermic needle with a propeller? And I mean, they're just <laughs> crazy thing. But but they're wearing the same outfits that they would have other, you know, so fashion doesn't change at all. But now we can fly with uh, flappers. Right. <laughs> it's intriguing. I don't even know what this is. <laughs> Something's going on at the bottom of the screen there. Um, We'll look at the next one, I guess. All right, it looks like a house or a town on on train tracks. It's it's a, it's a alternate version for mobile home, like a Victorian Snowpiercer or something. Um, oh yeah, holograms. The, uh, the hologram phone, we're still waiting on that a little bit. We do have the video phone, which maybe is what they're talking about. Or maybe that's imagining TV, I don't know. Theater. Yeah, it says theater in the year 2000. Gotcha. Okay, good, good German skills, Tori. I don't know. This looks like maybe manufacturing the weather. I know that's. that's oh, been... yeah. It's the, it's the beautiful weather machine in the year 2000. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's been a future vision for, for a long, long, long time. <laughs> What's going on here? Train, train boat on fire. Lights on fire. Rob, I know you like this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I like this one because it's whimsical and it reminds us that as we think about the future, we can think about very serious and heady things and sustainability and climate change. And But we can also think about whimsical things like a, a boat that allows you to see the bottom of the sea. And I think it's good for students as you think about the future to re remember whimsy too. Your, your answers can be totally whimsical if, if that's what suits you like the undersea-ish uh, shift. All right, so as, as we wrap up with this, um, 
want to ask our contestants to to bring their bring their work into the slideshow we're going to share in a minute. Um, so we can show the work that you've done here. This last one is again. I don't know what's going on here, but maybe that's this. this that will be the case with what we make too. Like a hundred years from now, no one will understand what we're talking about. <laughs> I think the description for this one said it was like envisioning a glass roof covering entire cities so oh. they're protected from the elements. Like if your weather machine breaks down, create the bubble um, and somehow get the sunshine in there. <laughs> yeah, all right. So um, are you all ready to, to come back on and share a little bit about what what things from the future you created? Um, is anybody up for going first here? And Tori's going to bring in the slideshow, the slide deck. All right, so it looks like we've got Rob first. And remember, Rob's prompt was in the year 2121, in a future you would like to live in, there is a set of overalls related to insects. Yeah, so, so uh, were I to have uh, enough time, what we're supposed to do here is to imagine something visual, sketch, photo, collage, uh, or maybe audio, video. Um, but in the time we had, while I was also trying to think about these things, text was easiest for me. And so I wrote overalls or clothing. I choose to imagine a future for clothing in general rather than focusing on overalls specifically. We can imagine a variety of future scenarios for insects and clothing. We can imagine a scenario in which insects are sustainably used to make clothing, mealworm underwear, honeybee hats. Alternatively, we might imagine a scenario in which insects are being used to recycle used clothing to turn that clothing into energy, into food for animals, or even into food for humans. But for me, the most intriguing possibility is to imagine that in thinking about the future of clothing that we learn lessons from the biology of insects. We can imagine clothing that, like the exoskeletons of ants, favors some beneficial microbes and disfavors other pathogenic microbes. Could we make clothing that might help to save us from some future pandemic? Or could we learn from insects with regard to the ways in which they keep themselves warm and cool? In the future, the Earth will be warmer uh, and more parts of the Earth will be more extreme in their climates. Do the exoskeletons of the insects that live in such climates offer us lessons in buffering such extremes? Finally, we know that many insects communicate with each other as a function of the aromas associated with their exoskeletons. Could we also communicate subtle messages via our clothing? What sorts of messages would we hope that we could communicate? What messages could help to connect us in a just and ethical global society? That's, so that's oh. what I've got. And I, I didn't get around to the, the, the visuals, but that's what I would do next. Yeah. But you can imagine, and, and that's, uh, you know, our students are going to have a lot more time to work on this and to turn that um, that vision into um, into something visual with a collage or a sketch or whatever their medium of choice is. Yeah, um, so I, I think I might have drawn some mealworm underwear if I had time. Yeah. Uh, I might have imagined people connecting and communicating via their clothing and what that would look like. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I, I didn't get there in this in this moment. Yeah, and I think this um, your response here really speaks to one of the the, the core parts of the the course, which is um, you know the interdisciplinary um, nature of research. Um, here we're talking about something biomimicry, where you, you would imagine you'd have to have an entomologist or a team of entomologists working alongside um, you know clothing fashion. Um, design teams. So that's that's a really interesting proposal and one that could very well happen here at NC State. Yeah, and, and I, th I think it, um, I mean, one of the most exciting things about being at NC State is that we have expertise that really runs the gamut, you know, from high fashion to uh, insect exoskeletons, from, you know, using microbes to get rid of industrial waste to, you know, making hats inspired by microbes. And, and so I, I, I think that that that's exciting as a as a faculty member, and it's and I know it's also exciting as a student. How do you embed yourself in those connections across disciplines, and and hopefully these prompts are one way of beginning to think about that. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Rob. I think we'll move on and and see uh, what Jordi or Melissa has up next. Uh, 
Yes, um, I didn't. I wasn't quite sure how to do this on the on the slide, and I didn't want to waste time trying. And and I again, if I had had more time, I had drawn something or done something. But mm -hmm. I I thought the most productive productive way or uh, effective way to to use my time was to just take notes and think of something and and convey that. that. Sounds great. Yeah, happy to hear. Okay. And so. And mine was passport, a passport related to power. And um, I took uh, one of the ideas that, that we discussed uh, before, and I, I explored that one a little bit further. And it's the, the idea that, of course, for humans, I, I will hope that there will be no such thing as passports because there will be no such thing as frontiers certainly no walls or, or physical impediments or political impediments for, for people to move from one place to another. But I expanded that into uh, something that's very much part of the view that I have for, for a future that I would like. Um, and it's, it's a future in which um, humans, we humans think uh, in an ecocentrical uh, rather than an anthropocentrical oh, right, yeah. way. So when we think of rights, when we think of power, when we think of uh, um, organizing the world and, and creating the world, we think not as uh, something that belongs to us or in which we are the center and have the power, but um, something that is shared and that is uh, interactive and that is uh, that has to be you know, with power comes responsibility. So I'm thinking in terms of responsibilities. So how does this have to do with, uh, or how does this affect passport? I'm thinking the idea of, um, since a passport is a document that gives you the right to move and to travel, I'm thinking that we should uh, recognize that animals should have that right as well, migratory, animals in particular, a lot of the things that we do as humans, um, fences, roads, uh, dams, um, in, you know, construction, traffic, lots of the things that we do for our benefit or, or for our needs or, or what we believe are our needs are very detrimental to animals and to the, the ability of animals to migrate and to move. So I'm thinking of a passport um, in the sense of uh, a document that will recognize and protect animals' rights to move, to migrate safely, and to be safe through the migration, and um, and to find and to be able to arrive to the places that they are supposed to arrive at the end of their migrations and find what they were supposed to find at the end of their migrations and be able to, to, to wow. return. So um, a passport for animals would be something like that. A, yeah, that's, a, that's a really great thing to, to, you know, I can see a lot of different ways to explore that further. Um, so I, yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. I think of the idea of power. And I turn it around a little bit and transform it into responsibility. Absolutely and defense of animal rights. Uh, so in a certain way, it means giving up giving up power, giving up human power and, and sharing it and, and recognizing the responsibility that comes with, with power. So yeah. that's the type of thing that I was thinking of. And I would have come up with something more specific had I had more, more yeah. time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jory. That's, that's a really wonderful thought, um, thought journey that you've taken us on. Um, Melissa, you want to share what you came up with? Sure. So um, whenever I uh, start any project, I like to kind of concept map and kind of just throw all my ideas out there. So um, like I mentioned, I was kind of immediately taken with this idea of 3D printing. And I remembered seeing an article shared from someone here at NC State where they um, had begun using uh, plants and, and 3D printers. So um, using 3D printers to um, uh, and plants in, in creating um, structures, uh, biological small structures. Um, and so I, I kind of uh, took, 
kept going from there, I started to wonder um, what other types of biologicals have been combined with 3D printing and just did a couple Google searches and, and saw that um, there are people who, who are working on this stuff. And that was really cool that they could kind of combine the, the biological um, with the 3D printing, that was super excited to me. It's super exciting to me. And then I started to think about um, some of the really cool things that plants and microbes can do that we can't do, um, such as carbon fixation. And I started to, to wonder if there's ways that we can combine some of their really unique metabolisms of plant and micro, plants and microbes in with our um, with the things that we wear, the things that we use every day. Um, and so of course, I would love a beautiful uh, dress made completely of flowers. Um, but maybe more realistically, are there ways to 3D print materials with um, with algae th throughout the, the materials? And, and could they uh, conduct photosynthesis from um, from the materials that we're wearing. Um, one of the things that I am both scared and uh, interested in learning about in the future is, you know, as our as our world changes, um, we're going to be learning about more and more microbes that live in ways that that we didn't know about. And um, undoubtedly, they will have really unique metabolisms. Are there ways that we can harness that um, to work to uh, to our advantage? Um, plants and microbes do a lot of things that we cannot do. And um, I, I wonder if we could it, it sort of become our own little walking ecosystems that, that might be um, a yeah. bit more sustainable. Oh, that's really exciting. Well, thank you all so much. Um, we really, really enjoyed the discussion and seeing what you came up with these exciting visions of the future. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our stream now. So I just, again, wanted to give a warm and generous thanks to our contestants. Again, Rob Dunn, Jordi Mari, and Melissa Ramirez. You'll be seeing and hearing from them in the Wicked Problems course in the course of the next weeks. Um, and also uh, many thanks to our audience. We thank you for your time and for joining us here. And um, just one last thing that we wanted to leave you with for those of you working on the Think From The Future activity, if there's any way that we can help, we have a few options for you to reach out. So the library is here to help you throughout your time at NC State. Um, for this particular project, you can reach out to our Innovation Studio team directly via the email address here on the slide. Um, the next link there is uh, for media support. So the library has a wonderful program of supporting media creation. We have cameras, for instance, that you can borrow. We have excellent student experts who can help you with media projects who can meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. So all of that's at that link there, which we'll also put in the chat. Uh, and then anytime you need help from the library is a great place to start is Ask Us. So you can just go to the library and look for the Ask Us logo, click on it, you can chat to a librarian. They can put you in connect, connect you with any of the resources that we have. So we we'll hope you, that you'll take advantage of that um, now for this course and throughout your time at NC State. And I just wanted to say thanks again to all of y'all. This was super fun. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing y'all at NC State. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody.